every time that we are broadcasting from here, uh, the environment is changing so much that every time I feel like we are in a totally new world and a new reality. Uh, when we when we say new reality, we mean uh, many many different things. We we understand that technology is changing and changing the way we we live, we communicate. The geopolitical environment is changing quite dramatically uh, in, the, in, in, in the last uh, years or so, and definitely today, like literally those days, we uh, in this part of the world we feel how fragile the world can be, uh, the frozen conflicts that has been frozen for uh, more than a few decades uh, are becoming again points of real tension Azerbaijan and Armenia uh, in many other places in the world we, we observe uh, tensions just growing and this is almost becoming a new normal for, for our lives uh, but definitely a pandemic and everything related to pandemic and our response to the pandemic has almost changed entirely the way we communicate, the way we travel, the way we interact. Uh, in this light, again, our Zoom conference is now becoming something very traditional, very usual. And uh, I'm glad to see uh, the, I'm glad to welcome the three wonderful professional and uh, gurus of negotiation and academics, but also practitioners of negotiation that will be today with us. Uh, and it's my super pleasure to introduce Sonia Rauschutz, uh, CEO and founder of uh, Wien School of uh, Negotiations. And she was uh, teaching in Harvard University uh, yeah, since 1999 to 2002. She was collaborating and still, as far as I understand, collaborates with one of the founders of the uh, Harvard Negotiation Project and uh, author of the uh, Getting to Yes, uh, Roger Fisher. Uh, it's also my, my pleasure uh, from Wien. We also having today Anthony Venice and John, uh, author of several uh, international best-selling books on international negotiations. Uh, also a Rio practitioner who, who also participated in the mediation of conflicts in Syria, in Turkey, in Afghanistan, in Georgia, in Ukraine. So in many places that still remain part of the of the international tensions. So. Uh, he's also a professor of U American University in Washington, and uh, it's a great pleasure to have you today with us, Anthony. And uh, Moti Crystal, uh, who is definitely someone who I should normally expect to have here in, uh, in, in this room, but given COVID and, uh, and all, all of the restrictions, he is, uh, he's now as remote as the other speakers. <laughs> Uh, from his uh, uh, landlocked, uh, not landlocked, but locked <laughs> physical location in Israel, not landlocked at all. Land, land, yeah. Landlocked. Yeah. Land uh, locked, yeah. In, uh, but definitely I hope that your soul is with us here in, 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 in Russia. And uh, uh, Moti is a, both somebody with very practical experience in different soils and different cult cultures and countries, a fantastic guru of uh, teaching and, uh, and helping people to learn negotiations, but also somebody with very practical skill and uh, from liberating the uh, uh, hostage situation, but also to back to practical business situations. And today I hope we will discuss negotiations from very different angles, international negotiations from the political, geopolitical, but also human, cultural dimension. Uh, I have to do a, a little informal part before we start asking questions and talking. Uh, as part of the new reality preparation, Skolkovo has also contributed a little bit. So we launched a course uh, that's called uh, Negotiation in New Reality from Survival to Success. And we've successfully run the live course together with Moti uh, this summer, and soon we'll have a new course. So at this moment, for those who are joining us in the webinar, they could also use the uh, hyperlink link to go and register. It will be a QR code in the, in the screen. I, I think we will show it several times and in the end. So if you will be interested to know more about negotiations and learn more, 
definitely we are welcome you to join us in this live course. So having said all of those intros, it's truly, again, I'm a little bit privileged because I see you all as soon as, almost as if you were together with me in the, in the fireside chat. So it's a very cozy and, 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 and nice place. I hope you'll have a feeling of this, of this uh, real life conversation. Feel free to interrupt and jump in. So we'll, we, will, we will definitely use this opportunity to have a free, a free discussion. And my first question to all three participants with a little bit different caveat to everyone will be around this new reality, uh, new international negotiations. My first question will be probably to you, Anthony, as again, we, we, we're observing a changing world. Uh, we're observing uh, lots of conflicts that are that were perpetuated, but some, I mean, nowadays they can become very sudden, they become tensions that we see. We see tensions inside the nations, we see international tensions raising, or apparently it feels this way. Uh, you, had, you had fantastic experience of, of mediating, of settling, of at least trying to bring peace to many different places. Uh, geopolitics, culture, pandemic, technology, all of this is now impacting us. So what's your maybe intro comments to the current situation and uh, current possibility, current uh, approaches to, to international problems, to international conflicts and hopefully making peace in, in, in those places? Усилия по прекращению огня часто плохо структурированы и основаны на плохом понимании динамики конфликта и при плохой информированности. Сколько было, сколько существует соглашение о прекращении огня в мире? Сколько всеобъемлющих соглашений было заключено? Когда мы занимаемся такой работой, два должно быть цело, цели. Во-первых, реально прекратить огонь, во-вторых, открыть путь для новых переговоров для всеобъемлющего урегулирования, то есть урегулирования первоначальных политических споров. И, к сожалению, переговоры часто проваливаются, не удается заключить, прервать огонь, прекратить огонь и не удается открыть путь для переговоров об урегулировании. Конечно, в такие времена, как последние семь 8 месяцев, когда даже трудно встречаться лицом к лицу друг с другом, ООН призывает всех, призывает прекращать огонь даже без вмешательства международного сообщества, но это продолжается, независимо от того, есть пандемия или нет. Мои исследования в последние годы посвящены тому, почему соглашение прекращения огня терпит неудачу. Первое, очевидно, тут требуется участие на очень высоком уровне, чтобы стороны хотя бы на время прекратили огонь. Мы это видели регулярно в одном случае за другим. Необходимо политическое, а также военное лидерство, чтобы хотя бы маленькую короткую паузу заключить. А что требуется, чтобы возобновить боевые действия? Да самый нижний чин может нарушить соглашение о перемирии. Очень легко сломать uh, to stop the fight. Uh, additionally, I think we, we have to understand that fighting forces in this day and age are often suffering from a condition of fragmentation. They are multiple small groups acting in coordination with each other or not in coordination with each other. So if you make a ceasefire with one, what's the guarantee that the others will um, comply with the idea that you have to stop the fighting even temporarily? Frankly, this is a problem even for government forces as well, when uh, there is a, a disunity of command and control. If you don't have control over all your 
let's say, battalion commanders, you can have one that just decides, hey, we're going to continue fighting for a while, as you've seen in places like the Philippines. Um, and finally, it, it is possible that seeking to end the fighting reduces some of the incentives for making the long-term peace. So these are some of the thoughts that I've been grappling with uh, in the last few years about the need to get ceasefires right and the need to guarantee that they will uh, make some progress towards the comprehensive peace. If it's okay, I'd like to share a little graphic um, with the students, with the participants um, that Sasha has uh, available for us to, to yep. share. To... Yeah, could we please bring the, the, the slides? And I don't know if I can see it that uh, you are showing it, but uh, let me know when it's when it's visible. Yeah, just a sec, we'll see. And actually, while I bring in the slides, it's it's. Uh, I would like to explore maybe in in few instances the, the point that you're making that the ceasefire could could be uh, counterproductive for longer term peace. That sounds a little bit counterintuitive. Could you could you explain? The counterintuitive part, of course, is, is part of its problem. <laughs> the idea that you are removing the pressure from the parties, that you're making it easier for them to continue in a fighting stance is the, is, is the issue. The fighting is painful. Civilians pay the cost often. Infrastructure is destroyed. War ultimately is a destructive uh, engagement. So when you, when you take the pressure off the parties, when they no longer are confronting the costs of war, uh, in some cases it seems that their incentives for making compromises on the way to comprehensive peace are a little bit removed. They might decide, let's, let's survive to fight another day rather than to make the hard compromises of making peace. This slide that I'm sharing with everybody now um, shows my thinking on how a good ceasefire has to make progress in two axes. One, on stopping the fighting, and two, on creating progress towards the comprehensive peace. And if we look at these two things together, you see the, the lower left-hand quadrant here, uh, an agreement that doesn't meet either of those criteria. We can consider a type one sort of ceasefire, a failed ceasefire. While um, as we move to the right, one that makes progress on, let me see what, it, what my slide says. I need my glasses, sorry. <laughs> uh, one that makes some progress on the comprehensive peace, but has limited success in stopping the fighting we can consider a kind of second typology of ceasefire negotiation outcomes. While one in which the fighting stops for long periods of time, but there's no progress on the comprehensive peace. For example, in the frozen conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan, you see that these situations reignite themselves periodically, and then they go back into a frozen mode. The fighting keeps coming back, but the talks don't don't ever take hold, is a third kind. And finally, the fourth kind is the one that is the most elusive kind, the one that has success on both fronts. You stop the fighting or stop it for majority of the time, and you get the parties to work together. Now, um, there are some technicalities in all of this, right? There are, there are some real intention issues. Some parties stop the fighting only opportunistically to rearm. This is one issue. What are the party's intentions? The second is whether uh, a ceasefire comes about because the parties want it or because it's been declared in the UN Security Council. I think there's a big difference. If the parties want it themselves, it's more likely to stick possibly. And a third factor, of course, other than the fragmentation that I mentioned earlier, uh, revolves the monitoring and uh, enforcement mechanisms. There are very light touch kind of enforcement mechanisms to stop fighting or to monitor its pause and some very ha heavy handed ones. And you need to pick the right mechanism for the, for the conflict itself. As, as Moti can tell us, there's you know, a contingent of UN guys, UN uniformed guys on Mount Hermon in the Jolan. 
you know, ski patrol guys. They're not armed. They are there to, to indicate whether hostilities are going to break out. And that's enough for the most part. Uh, in other parts of the world, that kind of, of uh, monitoring is, is nowhere near sufficient to get parties to stop the fighting. Let me pause there, Marat. Yeah, thank you, Anthony. And, and I think, again, it starts to shed some light uh, as to why we have so many frozen conflicts, which, which is, again, it's, it's a very fragile soil, a difficult soil of, say, of saying what's, what's, uh, what's the right solution to those unsolvable questions. But what you're technically saying, sometimes it's easier to freeze and then still to have the conflict in the hands for, 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 sure. for longer. And then those frozen, we know, those frozen conflicts by definition, one day become unfrozen. They are not, they are not lost conflicts, they are not, they're not losing their power. Uh, unlike the, the, the volcanoes, they are, they are uh, real conflicts with, with the capability of, of ex exploding. And uh, we'll talk more about that. And I think we also will come back to the implication of this into, into more practical lives of, 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 real, of, of ordinary people. But I would probably shift the gears here and uh, I'll try to ask the same question, but with the other angle. Uh, Sonia, uh, I know, I, again, I know that... Uh, you're also interested in exploring the how this uh, different, diff different world, agile world. Some people say VUCA world. I mean, they are predictable, the frustrating world. Depends on <laughs> how do you like to explain it, how it really uh, changes our human perspective to communication and negotiation and conflicts that we have on hands. What's really changing on our human side? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for, for the question. When you ask what's changing, how are we creating this new reality? Well, one of the things I see is um, that there is a great opportunity to co-create this reality. And I do see things happening. I grew up uh, in Austria, close to the boundary of Hungary and Slovenia, so in the heart of Europe. So I'm uh, by definition a boundary spanner. I grew up about 20 kilometers away from the Iron Curtain in Hungary. So being very aware that there is another side, there's another perspective. Continued doing that um, in my professional world and uh, you know, working with clients from businesses and working with clients from the public sector. Um, I do believe and strongly believe that this is a great opportunity to co-create. What do I mean by that? For many years, we've been looking at the substantive outcomes. You know, how can we impact the outcome? Anthony has written a wonderful book called Expanding the Pie. You know, how can you create innovative results, greater results together? However, you know, what we had to realize is that we were stumbling over the people side, especially since we are cooperating and negotiating Globally, we've become more and more global actors. Our businesses run globally. We are working across cultures, even if it's just neighboring countries. And, you know, some, some are success story and some are conflict stories. But what you had to realize is that we started stumbling over the people side. And there's a third side to negotiations, which is the process side. And um, I believe all of us who love negotiations are process experts. We love, you know, facilitating from one situation to the next, uh, facilitating meetings, making meetings smoother, but at the same time having clear and good conversations. So while I, be think, I believe that process is one of the key aspects of negotiation, it also has to do with the agility of people. So... Um, the agility of people is something where people make a difference. You know, when I listened to Ruben's statement this morning, I was moved. I was moved because it's a statement about an engaged human being who asks to engage, who asks human beings to be accountable and to step up, to step up, but also to have compassion, to have compassion for each other's side. And compassion means more than empathy. Compassion really means it's the willingness to struggle with the other side. Having said that, um, there's one tool we're working with that's called compassionate accountability. 
And in order to be compassionate and accountable in conflict, in order to negotiate our future together, our presence together, you need to develop three different skills. You need to develop openness, and that means empathy. That means also sharing your vulnerability, saying that you're frustrated, saying that you're sad, saying that it's devastating to look at the current situation going on in your part of the world and in many other parts for that matter. At the same time, it needs resourcefulness. So it needs not only resourcefulness to come up with great ideas, but it needs resourcefulness of being creative, being agile, being persistent, um, you know, walking your talk. So resourcefulness is the second one. And many of us have, you know, are open and resourceful, but the same type of people sometimes lack persistence. So persistence is the third skill that you actually need to deal with conflict constructively, to, to be agile in negotiating and communicating. So when we talk about persistence, it's about having boundaries. It's about, you know, walking your talk, committing your deeds uh, in alignment with what are you saying? You know, as we talked about ceasefires, what are we actually doing? Do we have a firm commitment? Are we actually able to have a firm commitment? So when you look at these three skills, openness, resourcefulness, and persistence, we're talking about compassion and about accountability, dancing with each other. And some people have great compassion, but great compassion alone gets you nowhere. So when you look at the same time at the other side of the coin, you're talking about persistence and accountability. But some of us are very accountable. And when you're too accountable and have no compassion, it becomes, you become lonesome. It's alienating. You hold up the torch on your own. So what you actually need is people with skills to deal with differences constructively, to come to the negotiation tables, to work the substance, to manage the people and to control the process. It's these three types of skills that you need in this new world. And the, the interesting thing now is it's not negotiable anymore. We are all connected, whether it's a pandemic, whether it's a conflict, we all realize we are connected and we need to contribute. So one of the things that I see in this new um, new world, new norm that we are creating is that there is this opportunity to co-create, but you need the skills and the tools for that. Some time ago, I was invited to work um, in Kosovo. And um, as part of the, the deal there, the, the international community established mediation committees. The idea basically was that parties in communities would get together from all different backgrounds and that they would actually mediate the conflicts in the communities. Well, there was one problem with that. With all the good intention and all the history and the willingness to put things behind if they could, there was no skill, there was no toolkit. So when I look at this new world situation, and you see the same thing with the new companies, with new startups, and many of these rules apply to the, to the new companies. It's an opportunity to co-create the new normal. It's an opportunity to wake up and actually grow your skills and then to show up at the negotiation tables and to be present and be, become part of the solution, struggle together with compassion and struggle together with accountability. So, um, yeah, that's what I wanted to say from the more the people side, because in the end, it's the people who make the difference and people who matter. And I really uh, want to salute Ruben for making this statement today and asking people to step up and take their places wherever they are in their circles to take initiative and be part of the solution. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sonia. And then that's, again, thank you for, for taking part from your side and taking responsibility and I mean, uh, voicing up your position. That's also I mean, part of this, this ability of being, uh, of being able to, to participate, to take, to take active role. And I think, again, to me, that's, 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 that's uh, your, your words about dual ability at the same time to be, to be 
cooperative to be able to to listen to each other to to create something together but in the same time to be real to be to be strong to be moving i think it's one of the fundamental thing that in the overall in the conflict and, and, and negotiation series something that for me was a discovery like a russian we are very much a, a culture of of power to us in many ways uh, it's really important to be strong and uh, and the fact that those two are not opposed, in fact, but really <laughs> can be learned to, 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 to practice together, this is almost like a, a, f a fundamental discovery that you, can, that you can develop those two skills and you can practice both and you can be, be strong in cooperation and strong in, 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 in persistence. And that, that, that's, again, I know how, what, what you, could you say a few words maybe on the development possibilities? A good thing, it's skills, it sounds, it's skills, does it mean you can develop? Does it mean you can yeah. learn to yeah. be better? I mean, um, regardless of what personality you bring to the table, what talent you bring to the table, uh, and what experience you have and how quickly you learn from your experiences and whether you're doing that in groups and supervision, what is critical is that you, you sharpen your toolkit and this is the time to do it. To sh we, it's very, um, it's commonly known that there are different sides in negotiations, there are different sides in conflict. Having said that, if you want to develop the skill of openness, you need to create a safe environment. And that's very difficult. You know, it's not about, it's, it's real contact. It's making contact, feeling the other side, sharing what's going on and doing that, you need safety. Um, I remember, you know, in, uh, in one of the meetings we had with the Israeli and Palestinian negotiators in Vienna, it took us a day to, to, to ask people that there was something going on, some issue was going around and nobody was speaking up. It took us a day to create an environment that finally somebody stepped up and said what it was about. And Anthony, you played a very important role in this and Moti as well. So, you know, it's easy said, you know, open up. You can only open up if you create a safe environment. And it could be a very small, safe environment. But unless you make real connections with people, there's no way of going forward because you will always be dealing with symptoms instead of the real causes. And that's a human connection. Um, so safety, creating an environment of safety is critical to open up. Curiosity is the second one. And of course, Persistence, predictability and persistence and consistency with what you're doing. So different environments foster that. Yeah, thank you. And, and it does feel to me that this safe environment is often underestimated as a real investment needed to, to go through not necessarily conflict negotiations or n normal communication. That's a very important investment that we all have to to do if we want to have communication that works and if we want to go through conflicts. I want us uh, to, to, to turn to Moti and actually we started the discussion a little bit about the importance of culture, about the, the, the fact that uh, we, we in the international arena we we negotiate through culture, we negotiate from from different standpoints and some of the most difficult conflicts are based on differences in cultures. Those are most difficult to solve, those are most difficult to, to understand even for many because sometimes when you're remote and you look at those conflicts you say what the hell is going on, well, what are they sharing, I mean, what's really the nature, but those people really are spending generations and we, with real energy, with real uh, dedication uh, to their cause and you Moti, you had experience in, in many places you, uh, and that's one of the uh, fundamental experiences that you're bringing to, to Skolkova campus, that you're bringing the ability to understand the culture. There's a sensitivity to the culture, to our classroom and to our real negotiations. Could you comment again on, on what's, what's happening uh, in this light, in the new normal? Are there some cultures that are better prepared to what's happening? Uh, is there any difference in how the different cultures are facing this, this new, 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 new situations and new developments? This this is a uh, uh, thank you, Marat, and I would like to uh, chime into the uh, things that uh, my my good uh, and old friends and colleagues uh, Sonny and Anthony uh, mentioned. When we look at uh, when we look at uh, a person in conflict, uh, we always look at uh, at least 
three different uh, layers or three different levels uh, through which any communication is conducted. And uh, those of you who heard or listened very, very carefully to the very, very important and powerful video that Ruben Vardanian uh, uh, published uh, yesterday, you can identify clearly these three levels in this uh, video. The first, and it is the basic, it's the human essence. Conflict is conducted between human beings with motivations, with ideas, with ideologies, with beliefs. And uh, the fact that we have to be aware of the very important human needs, dignity, respect, um, um, connection to the land, to the soil, all the things that we see at the moment erupting in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, if you don't see this human level, you will not be able to address any conflict. And uh, this is, this is uh, uh, fundamental. And uh, the second um, is the national or the cultural uh, aspect. Um, um, and, and when we say culture, we speak about uh, not only uh, Armenian or Azeris or Israelis or Palestinians uh, <clears throat> or, uh, you know, in Sri Lanka conflict or South Africa, but also religion, because culture and religion is tied up. Uh, many of the messages that uh, Ruben was echo were addressed to the very com uh, compassionate Christian uh, uh, culture, because the issue of compassion, as Sonia mentioned, is a very, very strong element in the um, uh, cultural being of, of, of people around us. And the third is the uh, profession. Um, not, not only who you are, but what you are. I think that Anthony referred to that when he mentioned the roles of military people and the role of politicians. Uh, because from my experience, one of the most strong bonding in times of conflict be it international or also be it business, is within people who have or share the same profession, like military or like engineers in a business conflict or finance people in a business conflict. These people can commute, despite the fact that they could be from a different culture or different uh, character, different human being, the fact that they all went through some, I would say, engineering education or military education something very, very strong uh, connects them. The, 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 we as uh, uh, negotiation professionals, uh, whether as a negotiator or as mediator, as Sonia referred to the, the importance of mediation efforts, when we address any conflict, we always look at these three angles in parallel. We look to find what motivates or what drives the human being, uh, being ca uh, compassionate, being persistent, being arrogant, what drives their national identity or cultural uh, identity, and how we can connect the bonds or the dots among the military people, among the politicians at the table, among the engineers or the environmentalists or the water experts. And if, if, I, if I'm not forgetting, Marat, your, your question about are there any cultures which are more uh, equipped to deal with the current uncertainties, putting aside international conflicts, I would say that cultures that have a more, uh, I would say, chaotic <laughs> uh, um, elements in their, um, in their mythology, uh, like India, or more systemic understanding of the word view, uh, like uh, Asian culture, 
I believe are more equipped than the Western culture who are coming from a linear analytical perspective that seeks uh, a solution for a problem. And this is something that I talk uh, a lot in Skokovo and in other uh, contexts, but I, I, I would like to put, to put a stop here because I think that I opened and, and I really would like to hear uh, uh, more of, of course, audience questions, but definitely Anthony and Sonia about all these three uh, uh, hooks that, that you connect to people on the human level, uh, on the uh, cultural or national or religious aspect, as well as the professional uh, bonding. Because I think that if you now go and listen again to Ruben, uh, you will hear how intuitively with his uh, uh, immense wisdom and experience, he speaks uh, about these three levels and it's our responsibility to take these three levels and turn it into something operational to reduce the current hostilities in, in the region. Yes, Modi, and thank you again. That's, that's, it's, it's, it's true that today in this environment, especially in, in this uh, part of the world, it's very difficult to, to speak broadly about um, negotiation and conflicts. We, we have so much of, of real attention to, to where the conflict is erupting. But I think it's also important to, to try to see the, the, the implications of, of, of the thinking to our business and private lives. And again, I would probably make this uh, transition with, uh, with, with what you, Moti, said, again, that we, we use almost the same frames and toolbox to, 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 to think of our real life sit daily situations, not only about the big, bold conflicts. And so, Anthony, you, you, you practice. You practice where you have uh, you have real conflicts in business and corporate world. And how would you comment? Maybe we will try to make it more pragmatic and more practical to our to our participants today, as to what's what, what's uh, what's advice for them. How how do we trans transfer this knowledge of international conflicts towards uh, uh, possibility to be more successful, more practical in in real world negotiations and conflicts? It's amazing to me that having done work both between individuals in conflict uh, as well as organizations in conflict at the political and social levels, it all comes down to people. So everything that Sonia and Moti have mentioned are, are points that are worth supporting. It comes down to individual people and their preferences, their training, their background, including their experiences, including their biases, including their cultural tendencies, all of these are the filters through which we experience a conflict and see it. Somebody who looks at a conflict today and sees 500 years of past traumatization is in a different position than someone that sees, hey, there's a, a temporary misunderstanding that we need to get over. The facts might be the same, but the frame around them is quite different. So it's always, it's always interesting for us to understand what is the frame around which people are looking at the facts. Is the unfreezing of the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan today a continuation of the Turkish genocide against the Armenians, which would be the frame the Armenians look at it through? Or is it a geopolitical uh, tension that's about territory and where borderlines have been drawn, which might be, for example, uh, the perspective of the Azerbaijan uh, leadership. It's interesting to see that there have been many contacts between top levels of both countries, as well as with leadership in, in Artsakh in Nagorno-Karabakh. So there, there, there's this other dimension, uh, Marat, that people have a deep desire to talk to each other to resolve their differences, but that there are obstacles to doing so. Why do we feel comfortable talking privately when, uh, when, there's, a, when, when there's a big audience looking at us, right? Uh, me having a, a problem-solving conversation with somebody uh, in front of all of their friends would be different than if me and that person were speaking privately. I often find that people are more willing to talk 
about how we got there and what we need to do to move forward when we can do so with a little bit of the, the safety that Sonia mentioned earlier and uh, an ability to start building bridges and shared understandings and move away from our preferred framing on the particular conflict. Then and only then can we move towards solutions. Solutions cannot be dropped in first. Yeah. Absolutely. But again, uh, just to maybe to explore a little bit the, the, the corporate world examples, uh, would you would you probably bring us one or two ideas of where where a similar situation or a similar approach could help in the, in, in the business context? And we uh, I hear this word, this magic word of context, which I think is probably the most popular word in Motius vocabulary. So uh, and uh, I think that's really a truly important word for, for any communication, specifically for, for, te for tension, for conflict. So, putting in a different context, uh, how, would, how would it work? Let me take a case I worked on personally a few years ago. A very large finance company worldwide, top leadership, um, right below the C-suite level. We're all in a very, very important legal conflict with each other that pretty soon became an interpersonal conflict that involved in the end about 12 high powered people in the organization. And their main dispute was about the privacy laws in the United States and elsewhere. C could they share the client's information with their business partners? And there was one side of this civil war, shall we say, that said, it's a new environment, internet commerce, we need to be able to do it. Let's, let's go beyond the laws. The laws were written 50, 60 years ago. They don't apply today. The other side of the civil war in the corporate world said, uh, no, we have to help our company comply with the laws as they exist and inform our bosses of where the, the, where the limits are. We cannot change the law. Pretty soon each side of this legal dispute found out that they were trying to influence the top leaders in opposing ways. And one side of this conflict felt that the other side was deceiving them and undermining them. So the people who were really on the pioneering side of, you know, let's break the mold, let's do new things, let's take some chances, let the law catch up later, uh, started going around the backs of the other uh, lawyers. This was all lawyers to the point where people were seeking psychotherapy, medication, trying to leave the company. You were losing high talent. Uh, people were distraught that they were being undermined, that they were being deceived. At least this is how they felt. And my role in that was to, to come in and hear people, hear with a lot of empathy why, why they felt betrayed. Um, and help the side that had done those actions understand their impact. I must say I had a very limited uh, effect here because they let me have like 35 hours of time to diagnose the problem and only three hours to, to help fix it. And these <laughs> <laughs> in an organization as big as this one was, a major credit card company in the world, um, they take a long time and they take a lot of effort and they take courage uh, from the people who realize I've done something that hurt my colleagues and peers. And I have to say, you know, we all need to get to step one rather than to step 10 in the conciliation process that would have healed um, both the legal problem and the personal issue um, at the top. Yeah, super. I mean, that's a very realistic example. Once you were describing it, I started to feel like, and that's how the conflict in the business looked like. I mean, that's... Uh, and it's true that you immediately start to use the analogies of real like heavy conflicts from, from real world. I mean, the civil war or, or whatever, it's perceived by people as very real and very, very much a destroying uh, force of this conflict is similar to, to a real uh, military conflict sometimes. Uh, Sonia would probably again continue this line of, of practical angle. And you mentioned several elements of, of a successful approach that you uh, you need to control the process you need to build a safe environment you mentioned the skills that we need to develop maybe you could share 
a few ideas or maybe some some tips of what 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 are the hows how you can for example control the process yes Thank you very much. I, I like the how question because we all describe very lovingly what's not working. And, and as Anthony said, people love spending time on, you know, diagnostic what's going on. But when you ask them to spend the same time on fixing it or going forward, then there's no there, time. Yeah. <laughs> then there's no time and there's always resistance you can count on, right? So that's where it takes courage and that's where it takes safety. <laughs> I want to also connect to what Moti said about agile cultures. Uh, you know, we in the German speaking countries, we sometimes think that relationships do not matter. We have this saying, stay on substance, stay focused, right? Um, however, looking at that, what comes with that is that there is a right reality, a right logic. And so I agree with Moti, cultures that have more of a chaotic approach, they um, believe automatically that there's not one way of doing things. You know, there's always chaos, things go always a different way. And one of the first things you need to understand when it comes to conflict is, you know, when what you expect and what you have is different, that's, that's just energy. There's nothing wrong, there's nothing good, nothing bad about this, but it's just something's going on. So when I expect something, and I want something and then it's different to what I experience, there's energy, you know? And then the question is, what do you do with that? What do you do? Are you talking about it? Are you swallowing it? Are you dealing with it in a way? Or are you developing drama, you know, where people blame each other and attack each other? So what we call it is you tame the energy, you work with the energy, you, um, you use that energy to create something. It's a fertile ground, but for that you really need the skill of um, also putting some boundaries down, not just only some openness. Um, it's one of the toughest things to be open and share, you know, I feel, um, I feel sad about the fact that we're not standing up. I'm, I'm anxious, I'm really concerned. I mean, Ruben Vardanian, he said it. He said it's the, the, the scariest thing is when people are indifferent. He shared emotions. It's the scariest thing. And um, when you talk about conflict and negotiations, one of the things that Moti also mentioned was the fact that people have needs and wants. And people might have different needs. And whether I need you know, to feel comfortable with someone or whether I need to trust that the facts you're giving me are straight. When we are struggling, when things get tough, we become suspicious of each other. You know, conflict is a lot about making the first, the second step first. You know, we always say, well, if you make that step, I make the other step. I make the, sec the second step. Um, so when, uh, when um, now in real life, What's happening? When I look in, in Austria or in, in Europe, what I see happening is that communities start working together. You know, they help each other out. You buy the food in the neighborhood, you go shopping in the neighborhood. Um, big companies, like in my case, I work with big corporations. Some of those big corporations just said, you know what? We're paying up front your fees. And uh, in order to reserve the time slot, and if the time slot is not happening, we'll do it half a year later, and it's perfectly fine. Um, other companies said, let's go ahead, let's create things together. So it's really a question of, can you express what's going on and can you cooperate together? And how do you deal with these differences? Yeah, I, I, like, I like all of your points. And uh, definitely together with Morty, you, you send us a nice message that maybe Russia with its... Uh, sort of middle ground so culture, which is definitely not very structured and definitely we are fine with uh, unruly situations. As, as we say in Russia, we have rules, but we also have rules of how not to obey the rules. So we, we definitely, this, this, this gives us hope. But the second element, <laughs> the second element that is really important uh, to me, that's really something that, uh, that, that makes me uh, keen to explore is, is this energy notion. It feels like, again, we are, most of us, at least again, the Western Hemisphere is, is really coming from the 
position that conflict is something definitely negative. So conflict is something that's worth uh, destroying or, or uh, avoiding and killing in, in, its, uh, in its substance. But what you're saying to a certain extent that this, 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 this ability to, 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 to face reality, this ability to project yourself and to bring the energy is something that, that, that's also part of the conflict and also natural element of it. It does make sense. It's, it, it has place in life rather than, uh, rather than a real box to be shelved and, 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 and avoided. I don't know whether you could comment on this. Well, if I want to uh, like to add one sentence, when you misuse that energy, you, have, you create drama, you create persecutors, you create victims, you create blame each other. And it's very entertaining. You know, drama is very entertaining. It's very quick, you know, it's a dance, people dancing with each other. There's, you can never dance alone. You always need somebody dancing with you. And victims, usually uh, people with victim behavior are usually very powerful uh, people uh, because they dance with people who rescue them and who, people who persecute them. Having said that though, is what if you take that energy and create something? That means you're struggling together you're struggling together with persistency, with dignity, but you're struggling together, but that includes openness. So each one of our listeners, you can ask yourself, are you good in being open and resourceful? Or are you being good in being resourceful and persistence? Yeah. Whatever skill you're lacking, that's the one that keeps you from really struggling together with dignity, whether it's difficult or not, but you work on it because by the end, it's a better result for yourself. Sounds very reassuring to me and hope that we'll be able to, to use more of it in our lives together with all those who, who join us. Moti, I have to, to, to pay uh, attention to what our listeners want us to, 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 to discuss and they really want more of hows. So they want more of tools and they want uh, actually to understand better how do we negotiate better in this environment that is also having the technological component, for example. We negotiate, we talk to you in Zoom. We, we had classes in Zoom, many of those. You had negotiations in Zoom. You had cyber negotiations in, in, through online. Maybe you could explore in those limited amount of time, but maybe again to share some few ideas as to how this dimension yeah. is, uh, can be addressed, if at all. Well, I think that the, uh, the most important thing in understanding um, is that we are entering into this new normal, new reality. And online and distance negotiations uh, will be part of our life uh, for the next uh, couple of uh, months, maybe years. One, and that's, that's in understanding. The second thing that I would recommend understanding is that we have to change the way we negotiate, we communicate via online and via technology, be it in conflict or be it in deal. Why? Because all the things, for example, that Sonia mentioned about drama, the online medium actually amplifies it. Because if you're angry at someone, how can you be angry on Zoom? Um, I always said, what would you do? Would you get closer to the, uh, uh, to the camera or, or turn off the computer? And, and things that you can do actually at a meeting, like uh, knocking on the table and things like this, they don't come across very effective in online negotiation. The second uh, important element is not about how you communicate, but rather how you read the body language of the other person. In real life, be it international conflicts or business conflicts or deals, and you know, Sonia, Anthony, we all set in all those emotional meetings that you saw the person saying something, but all her body, all her all his posture said exactly the opposite. And this is things that you cannot do in Zoom. So you have to be aware that uh, there's a big difference in the way 
things communicate over the platform. My uh, um, main advice is to make use on different platforms in parallel. So when you're negotiating on Zoom, try maybe to make a preliminary phone call uh, because actually emotions and feelings are much better heard on a phone conversation. So use this old <laughs> technique of a phone call, uh, not uh, via WhatsApp or via Viber, just uh, make a phone call and play with your voice and say things that uh, um, could be said, or, you know, I'm very moved. Uh, there might be a moment that I will need to turn off my camera, say, communicate. And during the negotiations, use parallel channels. I believe that the younger the negotiator, 25, 30, they are much more equipped in multitasking. So they can do a Zoom and in parallel send a WhatsApp or, uh, or another text message. So try to combine platform in order to be able to close this gap that exists in communicating your message and reading the message of the, of, of the other side. Another important tool is short meeting and uh, summarize it in, um, in, the, in text or in a document um, because what happens is that we actually spend the last uh, six, seven months zooming ourselves to death. And uh, people cannot do that anymore. So we should make, be disciplined and try to uh, make Zoom not more than business Zoom, not more than uh, 30 minutes and maybe before and after prepare something or send or make a phone call. These are some practical advice that I can share with you about this uh, uh, moving into the, into the Zoom and uh, <clears throat> the emotions, maybe Sonia or Anthony could elaborate on that. Emotions are everywhere. Even if you're in Zoom, even if you negotiate with a cyber criminal via uh, WhatsApp or uh, uh, Twitter, you have to be aware of that emotions and allow space for that emotions. Because a human being who is not in his comfort zone emotional comfort zone, Niedi Gavarilis will not come to an agreement. You have to bring a person to their emotional comfort zone, even in online uh, interactions. Well, thanks, Mori. That's, uh, I think that's, that's little part of what exactly people are looking for as to specific advice and specific hows. I am aware of, of, of the time and it's really running so fast. <laughs> it, you wouldn't really, you wouldn't really uh, you say that we already are uh, almost one, one hour in uh, life. And so I would probably ask uh, each of you to just comment a few words in the end. We, we've covered, we've created a fantastic uh, picture of, of this uh, international negotiation uh, phenomena with very different perspectives, but at the same time, you bring some kind of a, a rhythm, some kind of, of, of a common, common ideas that I think are all around the human dimension. And that's, that's really dear to my heart. So first of all, thank you for bringing this, but maybe you would comment in the end again, are we more optimistic? Are we less optimistic about where, where the real international negotiation are heading? Are we facing more hostile and more competitive world or are we moving to a world who will be learning better to cooperate and faster and more efficient into getting getting people uh, things together whoever mm. wants to start well if i could just uh, build on what uh, you just said but also what moti just shared it's um, when we talk about the people a very practical thing is first self-care make sure you come to the negotiation table 
in a way that you are not stressed or little, have little stress, that you come prepared with some inner peace. Um, you, knowing yourself helps you to also take care of yourself and manage yourself. The more important issues are, the more important a situation is, the higher the risk that it will derail. So coming with good self-care to the negotiation table, and we call that agile. Second, very practical, understand that people have different needs and um, have different logics, have different languages. Be prepared to speak different languages. Um, be prepared to, to give your best to adapt to whoever you're meeting at the table. That again means that you're very agile, um, but that you have the ability to connect and communicate with pe people in different ways. Last, the, um, as Moti said, we don't have the emotions on the negotiation tables. But what I love about these new negotiations, even though there's lots of Sumis, all of a sudden people start asking the question about purpose. What's the purpose of our meeting? What Why? are we hoping yeah. to get? Right? Why are we meeting and what are we hoping to get? And therefore, who is on the Zoom call and how much time do we have? So it's really again talking about you know the process design of a meeting, clarifying. And with that comes that people share actually their, their needs and wants. I need to stop in 20 minutes. I need to take a break now. I need um, to get a better overview of the facts. Can we share the screen? Let's work together. So there is something that comes with this. Let's work on something together. Um, and um, the true art comes when you stay agile through a difficult negotiation and not only yourself, but when you can reach out and offer a hand to somebody else on the other side. A gesture, a word, a tone, a setting. That's the human connection we're looking for. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's, that's a lot of very specific advices and very specific tools. Thanks. Uh, Morty Anthony. Let me jump in. What I find difficult to do in the Zoom online world is read my counterpart in ways that I'm better able to do if we are face to face. But there are still things we can do. There are pieces of language that we can learn uh, that I have learned from people much better than I am at negotiation, at making a safe place to confront difficult topics, painful things. When someone tells you, give me advice on how to help you with this situation. When someone tells me, how can I make this safer for us to discuss? When someone tells me, I want to do better at something that I know that they only have partial responsibility for, I have the other responsibility for. I'm, I'm hearing a person who is deeply skilled, who is modeling a behavior that I can now replicate back and they've made it safe for me to talk because they're not attacking me. I can drop my defenses and speak constructively, take responsibility for my part without feeling that the other person is just gonna put all that in their pocket and walk away. So we, we can learn these pieces of language and they, they can be effective by phone, they can be effective by Zoom. What, what is difficult is that here we are, we're kind of trying to feel the texture, but, but we have thick gloves on. That's the, that's the virtual um, disadvantage. We, we lack the, the, the ability to touch and feel what, what is happening with the emotions of the other parties, with uh, the inner life of the other parties. Again, the solution is, is language. Speak, ask, how is this impacting you? Are you okay? I can't read you very well. Help me find out what's going on with you, right? Make that, make that discussion. Let me stop there and give space to my dear yeah, colleagues. And we definitely, and as I was just reflecting that we definitely are in the learning journey. So we, we as human beings, we learn. So we, we just, we will learn and we will adapt and we will, we will 
become hopefully better and and, and using those, those tools as well. Uh, and Moti, uh, I I I I would like you know I was uh, I was listening very carefully to my to my friends, and I was uh, trying to listen to them from the ears. Uh, or with the ears of our uh, audience and our speakers. And um, uh, you know Marat because we are here in Skolkovo together, this, my friends. What Anthony and Sonia were talking about, it's not imaginary. This is not a rocket science that you will never be able to adopt or to use. These are exactly the skills that I get once a week from a former student of mine, a text message, an email, you know, we tried and it worked. And, and I'm not talking about... Uh, 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 what, is this always the same student? What? <laughs> is this always the same student? <laughs> no, 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 no. And, 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 and I'm talking oh, yeah. about... about uh, Tough Russian yeah. oil and gas industry, yeah. people with lust and seal. I, I'm not talking about, uh, you know, uh, uh, fluffy uh, fashionist. Uh, we talk about uh, um, changing the way you understand negotiations, changing the way you understand yourself, exactly as Sonia mentioned, decide that you want to take care of yourself. Definitely in the coming two, three, four months of Russian uh, uh, winter and maybe hope not another lockdown that is coming uh, in Europe already and in Israel definitely second lockdown. So there is a huge opportunity for you to look at the changes and the level of development, your skills, because it's possible. This is not rocket science. It's just being aware of the fact that you need to take control of yourself and take care of, of, uh, of yourself. And it's possible. Even if you're now the Ministry of Defense of Armenia or the Chief of Staff of Azerbaijan, uh, there will be a moment, either voluntarily, or that President Putin will force you to the table, that you will have to sit with people whom you considered enemies. And we've seen that. I'm as a party, Sonia and Anthony as mediators, that you actually, you need to sit to the table with people whom you wanted to kill a week ago. And now you need to connect with them on a human level, on a professional level, in order to save more life. And it is possible. We all were there. We all saw that it is possible. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, all of you. I mean, you've contributed probably the most important resource, your time and your energy uh, for this conversation. I hope our participants really enjoyed this conversation, one of the, uh, in, in the cycle of, of webinars. And as, again, to me, that's, that's so, so important to see people from, from different continents. So we have Middle East, we have United States, we have Europe. Russia right now, right here, and to many people, especially in Russia, it feels like all negotiations are, are, are especially in the West, are so much about rational, about uh, pure n no emotion, and really you just you just do your right thing. It's almost a calculus, a game, or I mean, a rational behavior. But as you all described, there's so so much. A different perspective that yes you have to be rational but you have the human perspective you have the energy you have the personality perspective and from conflicts on a global scale to individual conflict in maybe at you in your family you have to learn and you can learn those different approaches you can learn them you can mix them and uh, it's 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 really something that we all can can master better in this slide i hope that our participants would uh, 
would be interested to continue visiting our webinars, but also maybe at some point to decide to go for a deeper uh, dive in. Yes, and please bring you yes, the uh, information on the course. The next course will be starting in 8th of November, negotiations and new reality, and we will discuss most, most of the topic and most of the approaches that were lightly touched today. So thank you so much, uh, Sonia. Thank you so much, Anthony, and definitely huge thank you to Moti. That was a wonderful journey, a wonderful night to me. Very interesting. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for the invitation. Have a great evening. Thank, thank you, you, Marat and Sonia and Moti. Wonderful to be with you all. Thank you. Cheers, Moti. See you hopefully in Moscow soon. Ah, inshallah. <laughs> Let's be done here. Let's be done here.